thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure. First, your reaction to what's taking place in New York so far. Um, would it actually make a difference on the ground? And then talk about implementing any sort of plan afterward. Sure. Well, as your correspondent points out, it's a, it's a milestone to have the five permanent members of the Security Council, uh, along with other members of the Security Council, preparing to vote and presumably vote positively uh, on a roadmap for trying to settle the Syrian crisis. Uh, and to have Russia and the United States having pre-negotiated all this is very, very important because it's long been said without Russia and the United States, you're not going to get a settlement. And in the background, uh, it also requires Saudi Arabia and Iran to occasionally sit down around the table with each other and with others uh, and trying to hammer out an agreement since they're both major players on the uh, Syrian uh, conflict. But the fact of the matter is, is that Bashar al-Assad does not plan to step aside, as far as I can tell. Uh, the opposition uh, and many of the Sunni Arab states are demanding that he does step aside at the time a transition no government is formed that's supposed to have full executive powers. So why do we need Bashar al-Assad? Uh, and Bashar has the backing of the Russians and the Iranians. So as they always say, the devil's in the details. You can, you can give them uh, this blueprint, but uh, it doesn't mean anybody's going to follow it. Uh, and that is something to, important to point out. We want to also mention we're looking at live pictures now um, as the UN Security Council uh, prepares to, I guess, adopt this resolution. Um, you mentioned the future of President Assad. It's been a major issue between all of these countries. But when you look at this issue among the overall picture of what else is happening in the region, uh, what's happening with ISIL, does this say that Syria is not a priority in some way, that this has sort of been a bargaining chip, if you will, among countries? And if this does go to a vote, as uh, you know, if this goes to a vote to the Syrian people, will there be enough Syrians to even vote on a new president, a new government? Right. Who's left? It's a good question. Syria, as Syria, is a priority for Iran and Russia, uh, because both of them have their interests uh, riding with Bashar al-Assad, or at least with the regime of Bashar al-Assad. Iran wants to have uh, dominance in an area stretching from uh, Iraq through Syria into Lebanon. Uh, and uh, Russia has a naval base uh, at uh, the port of Tartus and uh, does not want to see, and neither of them want to see a jihadi state emerge. The United States' higher priority is to defeat ISIS, and it doesn't want to see a jihadi state emerge either in Damascus. So while the United States keeps saying we want Assad out, we don't really say when. Because we have seen a sort of shift uh, in, in rhetoric there by the administration on, on how to handle Assad. That's been uh, lately. What do you think uh, will happen? We have so many moving parts right now. And what, what does it say about the diplomacy that has been taking place when you have some of these countries that have been disagreeing on so many things come to the table in New York and what appears to be an unanimous agreement right. on what to do in Syria? I think every major country to this conflict can see the downsides to its interests. Uh, but the fact of the matter is every power involved in Syria has its own interests, and those interests don't necessarily coincide with another great power's uh, interest. And uh, so, uh, and even in the United States, there is a tremendous disagreement. We just saw a debate among Republican uh, candidates. They didn't agree about what should be done about Syria. Some were saying, well, Assad might be bad, just like Gaddafi was bad, but ISIS or uh, a jihadist takeover of Syria is worse, so why should we get uh, into the middle of it? And others are saying, we need more boots on the ground, we need to be tough. Well, you were once ambassador to Syria. Right. Uh, what about the Syrian people? You know, we have so many refugees that have fled the country. Many of them want to eventually go back to Syria at some point. When 
could that happen? And, and what would you say about the Syrian people from your, from your time there? Well, this will sound strange to some of your viewers who may not have ever traveled to Syria, but I find, you know, Syria is an ancient civilization. Damascus and Aleppo are two of the oldest continuously inhabited cities in the world. They sort of invented civilization there along the Euphrates Valley and the like. And generally, leaving aside that it was a police state, people were rather civilized. They got, a, you know, even if they didn't like each other, you didn't, you didn't see a lot of violence. You don't see road rage like you see sometimes in the U.S. or, uh, or even fisticuffs. So I was surprised by the amount of brutality that has gone on in this war because Syria actually, uh, particularly for foreign visitors, is a very ch was a very charming country with layers and layers of history and uh, different cultures uh, that have influenced its uh, development. Are you, uh, 10 seconds left, optimistic about what is happening right now? I am not, and of course it's the Syrian people, as you pointed out in your previous question, who are bearing the pain of all of this. Uh, and it's, it's horrible to see that more than half the country of 23 million people is not currently living uh, are not currently living in their own homes, but uh, in many of them, as you say, are refugees or displaced persons. All right, Ambassador Thomas Katu, thank you so much for your insight uh, during this developing story. Thank you so much. Thank you.